Against his parents' wishes, Kishan Kapoor spent most of his time in the bazaar. He loved it because it was forbidden, because it was unhealthy, dangerous, and full of germs to carry home. Ranbir loved the bazaar because he was born in it. He had known few other places. Since the age of 10, he had looked after his uncle's buffaloes, grazing them on the medan and taking them down to the river to wallow in mud and water. And in the evening, he took them home, riding on the back of the strongest and fastest animal. When he grew older, he was allowed to help in his father's cloth shop. But he was always glad to get back to the buffaloes. Kishan did not like animals particularly cows and buffaloes. His greatest enemy was Maharani, the queen of the bazaar, who, like Kishan, was spoiled and pampered and fond of having her own way. Unlike other cows, she did not feed at dustbins and rubbish heaps, but lived on the benevolence of the bazaar people. But Kishan had no time for religion. To him, a cow was just a cow, nothing sacred and he saw no reason why he should get off the pavement in order to make way for one or offer no protest when it stole from under his nose. One day, he tied an empty tin to Maharani's tail and looked on in great enjoyment as the cow pranced madly and dangerously about the road, the tin clattering behind her. Lacking in dignity, Kishan found some pleasure in observing others lose theirs. But a few days later, Kishan received Maharani's nose in his pants and had to pick himself up from the gutter. Kishan and Ranbir ate mostly at the chat shop. If they had no money, they went to work in Ranbir's uncle's sugarcane fields and earned a rupee for the day. But Kishan did not like work and Ranbir had enough of his own to do. So there was never much money for chat, which meant living on their wits or rather Kishan's wits, for it was his duty to pocket any spare money that might be lying about in his father's house and sometimes helping themselves at the fruit and vegetable stalls when no one was looking. Ranbir wrestled. That was why he was so good at riding buffaloes. He was the best wrestler in the bazaar, not very clever but powerful. He was like a great tree, and no amount of shaking could move him from whatever spot he chose to plant his big feet. But he was gentle by nature. The women always gave him their babies to look after when they were busy, and he would cradle the babies in his open hands and sing to them and be happy for hours. Ranbir had a certain innocence which was not likely to leave him. He had seen and experienced life to the full, and life had bruised and scarred him, but it had not crippled him. One night he strayed unwittingly into the intoxicating arms of a local temple dancing girl, but he acted with instinct. His pleasure was unpremeditated, and the adventure was soon forgotten by Ranbir. But Suri, the scourge of the bazaar, uncovered a few facts and threatened to inform Ranbir's family of the incident. And so Ranbir found himself in the power of the cunning Suri and was forced to please him from time to time, though at times, such as the holy festival, that power was scorned. On the morning after the Kapoor's party, Ranbir, Somi and Rusty were seated in the chat shop discussing Rusty's situation. Ranbir looked miserable, his hair fell sadly over his forehead, and he would not look at Rusty. I've got you into trouble, he apologized gruffly. I'm too ashamed. Rusty laughed, licking sauce from his fingers and crumpling up his empty leaf bowl. Silly fellow, he said. For what are you sorry? For making me happy? For taking me away from my guardian? Well, I'm not sorry, you can be sure of that. You're not angry? asked Ranbir in wonder. No, but you will make me angry in this way. Ranbir's face lit up and he slapped Somi and Rusty on their backs with such sudden enthusiasm that Somi dropped his bowl of aloo chole. Come on, misters, 
he said. I'm going to make you sick with Golgappa so that you will not be able to eat any more until I return from Masuri. Masuri? Somi looked puzzled. You're going to Masuri? To school. That's right, said a voice from the door, a voice hidden in smoke. Now we've had it, Somi said. It's that monkey millionaire Kishan come to make a nuisance of himself. Then, louder. Come over here, Kishan. Come and join us for Golgappas. Kishan appeared from the mist of vapor, walking with an affected swagger, his hands in his pockets. He was the only one present wearing pants instead of pajamas. Hey! exclaimed Somi. Who has given you a black eye? Kishan did not answer immediately, but sat down opposite Rusty. His shirt hung over his pants, and his pants hung over his knees. He had bushy eyebrows and hair, and a drooping, disagreeable mouth. The sulky expression on his face had become a permanent one, not a mood of the moment. Kishan's swagger, money, an attractive face and qualities made him, for Rusty anyway, curiously attractive. He prodded his nose with his forefinger, as he always did when a trifle excited. Those damn wrestlers, they piled onto me. Why? said Ranbir, sitting up instantly. I was making a badminton court on the Maidan, and these fellows came along and said they had reserved the place for a wrestling round. So then? Kishan's affected American twang became more pronounced. I told them to go to hell. Ranbir laughed. So they all started wrestling you? Yeah, but I didn't know they would hit me too. I bet if you fellows were there, they wouldn't have tried anything. Isn't that so, Ranbir? Ranbir smiled. He knew it was so, but did not care to speak about his physical prowess. Kishan took notice of the newcomer. Are you Mr. Rusty? He asked. Yes, I am, said the boy. Are you Mr. Kishan? I am Mr. Kishan. You know how to box, Rusty? Well, said the boy, unwilling to become involved in a local feud. I have never boxed wrestlers. So we changed the subject. Rusty is coming to see your father this evening. You must try and persuade your pop to give him the job of teaching you English. Kishan prodded his nose and gave Rusty a sly wink. Yes, Daddy told me about you. He says you are a professor. You can be my teacher on the condition that we don't work too hard and you support me when I tell them lies and that you tell them I am working hard. Sure, you can be my teacher. Sure, better you than a real one. I'll try to please everyone, said Rusty. You're a clever person if you can, but I think you are clever. Yes, agreed Rusty and was inwardly amazed at the way he spoke. As Rusty had now met Kishan, Somi suggested that the two should go to the Kapoor's house together, so that evening Rusty met Kishan in the bazaar and walked home with him. There was a crowd in front of the bazaar's only cinema, and it was getting restive and demonstrative. One had to fight to get into this particular cinema, as there was no organized queuing or booking. Is anything wrong? asked Rusty. Oh no, said Kishan. It is just Laurel and Hardy today. They are popular. Whenever a popular film is shown, there is usually a riot. But I know of a way in through the roof. I'll show you sometime. Sounds crazy. Yeah, the roof leaks, so people usually bring their umbrellas, also their food, because when the projector breaks down or the electricity fails, we have to wait a long time. Sometimes, when it is a long wait, the chatwala comes in and does some business. Sounds crazy, repeated Rusty. You'll get used to it. Have a chingam. Kishan's jaws had been working incessantly on a lump of gum that had been increasing in size over the last three days. He started on a fresh stick every hour or so without throwing away the old ones. Rusty was used to seeing Indians chew pan, the bitter leaf preparation which stained the mouth with red juices. But Kishan wasn't like any of the Indians Rusty had met so far.
he accepted a stick of gum and the pair walked home in silent concentration, their jaws moving rhythmically and Kishan's tongue making sudden sucking sounds. As they entered the front room, Meena Kapoor bounced on Kishan. Ah, so you have decided to come home at last. And what do you mean by asking daddy for money without letting me know? What have you done with it? Kishan Bhaiya, where is it? Kishan sauntered across the room and deposited himself on the couch. I've spent it. Meena's hands went to her hips. What do you mean you've spent it? I mean I have eaten it. He got two resounding slaps across his face and his flesh went white where his mother's fingers left their mark. Rusty backed towards the door. It was embarrassing to be present at this intimate family scene. Don't go, Rusty, shouted Kishan, or she won't stop slapping me. Kapoor, still wearing his green dressing gown and beard, came in from the adjoining room and his wife turned on him. Why do you give the child so much money? she demanded. You know he spends it on nothing but bazaar food and makes himself sick. Rusty seized at the opportunity of pleasing the whole family, of saving Mr. Kapoor's skin, pacifying his wife and gaining the affection and regard of Kishan. It's all my fault, he said. I took Kishan to the chart shop. I'm very sorry. Meena Kapoor became quiet and her eyes softened. But Rusty resented her kindly expression because he knew it was prompted by pity. Pity for him and a satisfied pride. Meena was proud because she thought her son had shared his money with one who apparently hadn't any. I did not see you come in, she said. I only wanted to explain about the money. Come in, don't be shy. Meena's smile was full of kindness, but Rusty was not looking for kindness, for no apparent reason. He felt lonely. He missed Somi, felt lost without him, helpless and clumsy. There is another thing, he said, remembering the post of professor in English. But come in, Mr. Rusty. It was the first time she had used his name, and the gesture immediately placed them on equal terms. She was a graceful woman, much younger than Kapoor. Her features had a clear, classic beauty, and her voice was gentle but firm. Her hair was tied in a neat bun and laced with a string of jasmine flowers. Come in. About teaching Kishin, rumbled Rusty. Come and play Karam said Kishan from the couch. We are none of us any good. Come and sit down, partner. He fancies himself as an American, said Mina. If ever you see him in the cinema, drag him out. The carom board was brought in from the next room, and it was arranged that rusty partner, Mr. Kapoor, they began play. But the game didn't progress very fast because Kapoor kept leaving the table in order to disappear behind a screen, from the direction of which came a tinkle of bottles and glasses. Rusty was afraid of Kapoor getting drunk before he could be approached about the job of teaching Kishan. My wife, said Kapoor in a loud whisper to Rusty, does not let me drink in public anymore, so I have to do it in a cupboard. He looked sad. There were tear stains on his cheeks. The tears were caused not by Mina's scolding, which he ignored, but by his own self-pity. He often cried for himself, usually in his sleep. Whenever Rusty pocketed one of the carom men, Kapoor exclaimed, Ah, nice shot, nice shot, as though it were a cricket match they were playing. But he did slowly, slowly, and when it was his turn, he gave the striker a feeble push, moving it a bare inch from his finger. Play properly, murmured Mina, who was intent on winning the game. But Kapoor would be up from his seat again, and the company would sit back and wait for the tune of clinking glass. It was a very irritating game. Kapoor insisted on showing Rusty how to strike the men, and whenever Rusty made a mistake, Meena said, Thank you, 
in an amused and conceited manner that angered the boy. When she and Kishin had cleared the board of whites, Kapoor and Rusty were left with eight blacks. Thank you, said Meena sweetly. We are too good for you, scoffed Kishin, busily arranging the board for another game. Kapoor took sudden interest in the proceedings. Who won? I say, who won? Much to Rusty's disgust, they began another game, and with the same partners that they had just started when Kapoor flopped forward and knocked the carom board off the table. He had fallen asleep. Rusty took him by the shoulders, eased him back into the chair. Kapoor's breathing was heavy, saliva had collected at the sides of his mouth, and he snorted a little. Rusty thought it was time he left. Rising from the table, he said, I will have to ask another time about the job. Hasn't he told you as yet? said Meena. What? That you can have the job. Can I? exclaimed Rusty. Meena gave a little laugh. But of course, certainly there is no one else who would take it on. Kishin is not easy to teach. There is no fixed pay, but we will give you anything you need. You are not our servant. You will be doing us a favor by giving Kishin some of your knowledge and conversation and company. And in return, we will be giving you our hospitality. You will have a room of your own and your food you will have with us. What do you think? Oh, it is wonderful, said Rusty. And it was wonderful. He felt gay and lightheaded, and all the troubles in the world scurried away. He even felt successful. He had a profession, and Meena Kapoor was smiling at him and looking more beautiful than she really was. And Kishan was saying, Tomorrow you must stay till 12 o'clock, all right? Even if Daddy goes to sleep, promise me. Rusty promised. An unaffected enthusiasm was bubbling up in Kishan. It was quite different to the sulkiness of his usual manner. Rusty had liked him in spite of the younger boy's unattractive qualities and now liked him more, for Kishin had taken Rusty into his home and confidence without knowing him very well and without asking any questions. Kishin was a scoundrel, a monkey, crude and well spoiled, but for him to have taken a liking to Rusty, and Rusty held himself in high esteem, he must have some virtues. Or so, Rusty reasoned. His mind, while he walked back to Somi's house, dwelt on his relationship with Kishin, but his tongue, when he loosened it in Somi's presence, dwelt on Meena Kapoor. And when he lay down to sleep, he saw her in his mind's eye, and for the first time took conscious note of her beauty, of her warmth and softness, and made up his mind that he would fall in love with her.